Hi, Juan Jose. Hello, Juana. So today my guest is Juan Jose Salazar Gonzalez. He's a full professor at Universidad de la Laguna in Tenerife in Spain. Uh, he's also known as JJ. <laughs> Uh, so, Juan Jose proposed many models and algorithms for a number of combinatorial optimization problems with emphasis in routing problems. Uh, he's also responsible for several, several important theoretical contributions for such problems. Uh, he's an associate editor of some relevant OR journals. Plus, he's uh, one of the most popular guys in the routing community. So, Juan Jose, uh, thank you very much for accepting the invitation. Muchas gracias. ¿Cómo estás? How are you? Bien, thanks to you for this wonderful opportunity to talk about myself. <laughs> De nada. So, uh, so to begin, tell me, uh, where are you from? Well, even if most of the people know me from Spain, being living, my, spending most of my life in Spain, I was born in Venezuela, in Caracas. Whoa. I was born in a different continent where I live now. I was born in South America in 1966, so I'm 54 years old. Um, but this was uh, a result of my parent Immigration. They, my, my parents and even my grandfather and so on, they are all from Kennedy Island, from Tenerife, from Spain. Uh, they were born here, but my parents, due to the economic situation during the 50s after the civil war in Spain, due to the dictatorial system, they had to emigrate. They tried to look for a better life somewhere else. And at that time, in the 50s, it was very easy to go to South of America. In the 50s, uh, Venezuela was the golden country due to the oil, the petrol. So there were many boats, very few airplanes, many boats, going from Europe to South of America, to Brazil, mm -hmm. to Argentina, but in particular to, to Venezuela. Uh, my parents, uh, before doing the military service, which at the time in Spain had to be done in Africa, in the Sahara. Sahara was at that time part of the uh, Spanish uh, country. Uh, before doing the military service, they simply took a boat and ended up in, in Venezuela. Uh, my grandparent, was so the father of my father was also another emigrant. Uh, I mean, emigrant trying to look for a better life. Uh, in the case of my grandfather, it was again it was the war uh, in the 20s, 30s. Spain was not a great country. There was the civil war, and he went to Cuba. Cuba wow. in the 20s, 30s was a wonderful country. Spain was the opposite. Venezuela in the 50, in the 60, was one of the better country to live. Uh, and Spain was um, in a kind of economical iso isolation. Uh, in particular, living in Kennedy Island, but that time after the Civil War, living in an island was quite difficult because the island were closed. There was no market, no economy, no way to succeed. So again, my parents simply took a boat, jump inside and end up in another country to start the life. Uh, and that's the reason why I was <laughs> born there. But they didn't emigrate due to political reason. They emigrated for economical reason, mm -hmm. just to find something to eat, to, to have a better life. Sure. Uh, just uh, at the beginning of the 70s, when I was, uh, when I was uh, four years old, they returned back to Spain. Uh, Franco was dying. The tourists uh, started to come to, to Tenerife. And there was a beginning of a better life here. And by the way, the beginning of a worse life in Venezuela. Uh -huh. Today, it's just the opposite. I mean, uh, at the time of the 50s, 60s, Spanish people used to go to outside, 
to Venezuela, for example. And today, many people from South of America, in particular from Venezuela, come to Spain. The situation is a bit the contrary. Yeah, it seems that they cannot be uh, in good in a good situation at the same time, right? It's almost like a constraint. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah, apparently to, I don't know, for, for something, something good, you also need to have something bad. Apparently, unfortunately, it seems that nobody can win when somebody win the mm -hmm. other groups. Unfortunately, uh, that's the real life. We are not living in Disney, very unfortunately. <laughs> Right. Uh, and yes, that, that's the point. Uh, did you so, did yes. you return to to Caracas uh, after all these years? Well, I have been a couple of times since 1998 when I already finished uh, my studies, my PhD, and mm -hmm. everything. I had a contract and a collaboration with the university in Cumaná. Universidad de Oriente, mm -hmm. uh, and I have been teaching for four consecutive years a PhD course, mm -hmm. but I could never go there with my Venezuela passport. I have two passports, one from Venezuela, one from Spain. Wow! But I was always going there with my Spanish passport because at that time I was young mm -hmm. and I didn't do my military service in Venezuela and I didn't want it to do. I did it in Spain, but uh -huh. I didn't want it to do it twice. <laughs> if I go with my Venezuelan passport to Venezuela at that time, I probably have to do the military service again there. I did it already in Spain, it was enough. So mm -hmm. yes, I have keep in contact with uh, Venezuela, they have a noir society, uh, they have, uh, I mean, I have many friends, colleagues, even students uh, there. So it's a wonderful country. Unfortunately, for the economic situation, I have to stop a bit of relation, but hopefully it will change soon and we get back again our fruitful collaboration. But yes, in the last year, no, there have been no much mm -hmm. contact. Yeah. Uh, so, how was uh, growing up in the Canary Islands during the 70s and well, 80s? It was okay. My, my, when my parents retained, I mean, in Venezuela, they were, my father was uh, working for a laundry, uh, cleaning clothes, and when he returned to Spain, he was continuing doing the same job in a hotel. Here in Canary Island, tourists started and it was easy. To, to work uh, for a hotel. So this is how my life was growing up, a family. I have a brother and a sister, and we were five with uh, the salary of my father. I was okay. I mean, I went to a public uh, school in a rural area. I, I learned my road uh, growing up in Tenerife. It was it was a uh, quite elementary and nice grow up mm -hmm. so no no it, it was okay and yeah. when did you decide to study mathematics well uh, apparently i was a good student <laughs> apparently <laughs> uh, to be honest i did the uh, the public school and then the secondary school and then i have to do to study something because uh, I mean my parents wanted us to study and it was not an easy decision for me. I know that many people know what what they want when they will grow up. It was not my case. It wasn't clear to me. The point was that mathematics was easy and that was the reason why I took it. Because apparently I was able to solve many problems that my friend couldn't solve. So for that reason, I said, OK, let's do mathematics. But I was not very happy. I mean, I was passing the exams with very good marks. I was the first in the first year. I got even a prize in the second year and so on. But every time I was feeling a year in my degree, mm -hmm. I wanted to go out from mathematics because in some time, I used to meet with friends from the secondary school, and some of my friends have done 
medicine, for example. And when a person see, oh, what, have, what, what are you studying? And, and I say, mathematics. Oh, wow. And what are you studying to another friend? Medicine. Oh, brilliant, you will help people. <laughs> mathematics seems to be apparently strange, weird. If you study mathematics, you are weird. If you study medicine, you will be useful. So I have several crises. Basically, every summer I have a new crisis. Fortunately for me, I have good professor that keep me insisting to keep going on in doing mathematics because of the ex I was doing good exam. And I found operational research mm -hmm. because operational research was a kind of applied mathematics for me. I bought a computer at the time, a little, today is nothing, but at that time I bought an abstract, a little toy. I started learning by myself basic and Fortran, and I found by myself what was called later for me, mm -hmm. I knew that, I mean, Today I know that it was existing in other county, but I put one foot in computing. Mm -hmm. So I started mixing mathematics and computing, and then I wanted to finish mathematics doing operation research. So that's why I conclude. Otherwise, if I wouldn't find applied mathematics, probably I would have skipped and go to medicine. I wanted to be useful. <laughs> For me, it was important to be useful. It, it was nice to solve one problem after the other and do name number and formulas and theorems. But uh, when I was walking along the road, I also wanted, I don't know, to feel useful. Mm -hmm. With operational research, modestly, modestly, I'm quite happy. Yes. Today. That's great. Uh, but your first contact with OR was doing, during a course or you discovered by yourself? Mm, well, uh, basically here, operation research is together with a statistic in Spain. The operation research is together with a statistic. And there was a professor doing a kind of combined, Miguel Sánchez, a kind of combination between statistics and operation research. Um, they invited uh, some uh, known people in, in operation research to come here to start the, the line. They were Paolo Tot and Bruno Simeone. Mm -hmm. They were two famous professors that uh, were invited by the University of Laguna using some European money. It was at that time, uh, talking about the late 80s. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the Erasmus program started, there was some money for inviting professors to visit Canary Island, and Canary Island was quite attractive, not for the university, but for the weather, for the beaches. I know but what some you mean. people came. Yeah, Jean Pessoa is, 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 is similar. <laughs> people come from the beach, yeah. you know? not exactly. Yes, from the my professor at the university in the last year, Joaquin Sicilia, Carlos González Martín, they were very clever and used this Erasmus money. It was the first year of Erasmus in Europe. Wow. They used this money to, to send an invitation and they got two of them. Bruno Simeone, a mm -hmm. famous professor in grad theory in Rome, mm -hmm. and Paolo Tot. In, from Bologna, course, and yeah. they came in the 80, in 1989 summer. They came here mainly for tourists. They also gave a talk. And when they were giving a talk, I went to the seminar and I was asking questions. Um, let's say that uh, I was quite lucky because Bruno Simeone invited me to go to Rome mm -hmm. for a course. Uh, that he was teaching a kind of summer course of uh, for a week that in my opinion it was quite breaking for me it was my really first step in the area 
Mm. And Bologna, the same summer, invited me to go to Bologna. And I took both invitations. So I went to Rome for a, in particular, it was a, it was a very uh, interesting Euro summer school. It was in Cortona. And I met there, uh, it was the, the, that course was in 1990. Uh, and I met there s several friends in 1990 that I already have today, and they are well-known people, like, for example, uh, Federico Manucelli, mm. from, full professor in Milan, Giovanni Reggini, full, also full professor, mm -hmm. Carlo Filippi in Brescia, uh, Paolo Nobili, also in Rome, Sara Nicoloso, uh, Daniele Pretolani. Uh, I mean, I met in, in this course people while at the same time I was following some lessons by Bruno Simeone, Stefano Pallotino, and Akin Bachin. Mm. So it was quite interesting, quite nice area. It was, that was my beginning in a patient research, mm -hmm. that course. And then when I finished that course, I went to Bologna for the second invitation. <laughs> Um, it, that was a wonderful beginning. I went to Bologna with the Erasmus program mm -hmm. as a student. I went there for a student. Um, I remember that in Spain, while Paolo Todd was giving the seminar, or at the end, when the Paolo Todd finished giving a seminar in Tenerife in, 80, in 1989, my professor was talking to Paolo Todd, and I, a student, was talking to his wife, Luisa. Ah. And talking to his wife, apparently, she said, oh, what a cute uh, <laughs> student. And she talked to Paolo and said, why don't you invite him to come to Bologna? And he did it. So, to be honest, the really promoter of my big jump to what was my PhD um, was Luisa, the wife of Paolo Todd. I thank her a lot. And then Paolo Todd was uh, I mean, amazing. Uh, in my life, in my academic life, uh, I have never met some, a person with a big uh, human personality. He's a wonderful person. Yes. So he made everything easy, everything easy for me. Mm -hmm. uh, I went to, to Bologna with no language, with no house, with basically nothing. And he found me accommodation, everything. He saw everything. Mm -hmm. I went there just for three months and I stayed there at the beginning for three years. And then even after, but let's say that he offered me when I arrived there even a PhD program. Mm -hmm. He found everything for me. Yeah. So, Paolo Totti was certainly my door to the OR world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was in the He's a great guy. 1990. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It is, it is. Mm -hmm. From the human point of view, cannot be better. And academically, he, oh, he's on sure, the top. Sure, sure, he's sure, on yeah. the top. He has been president of everything. <laughs> Uh, yes, the Euro, I, uh, uh, I for uh, uh, person. Uh, he's still active. He's still quite yeah. active. Yeah. He has created a wonderful school in Bologna and even around the world. Yeah. Even as a student all over the world. Yeah. If not a first generation, a second generation. Yeah, sure. I think you are the second generation. <laughs> Somehow, maybe. <laughs> you are part of the second generation. Yeah, but yeah. I'm sure every, a lot of people agree with what you're saying about him. Uh, he's, he's a legend, of course. Like, yeah. yeah. He so, helped me, for example, in, uh, when I arrived in Bologna for the accommodation, uh, in Bologna there is a, a, a kind of resident, but it's much more than a resident. It's a resident that was created by the Spanish people 700 years ago oh. for the first you know that bologna is one of the oldest sure, universities yeah, the oldest university in, in europe, europe yeah 
It is the oldest university, and when it was created, the Spanish people at that time, 700 years ago, where Spain didn't exist yet, they created a little residence for the Spanish student studying in Bologna. Mm -hmm. And the resident has not changed in 700 years. It has been every year about 10, 8, 10, 12 students go there, mainly only students dealing with law, mm -hmm. a few of them medicine, law and medicine because this was the typical study in Bologna 700 years ago. Mm -hmm. But thanks to Paolo Todd, I applied to that resident and because I was a student, Spanish and other things, so they accepted me. And I was living two years in that resident, following exactly the same style of 700 years ago. That's amazing. I mean, in the old fashion, I mean, we were dealing like a royal family. <laughs> you may imagine a person like me coming from a rural area. I mean, good, a wonderful family, by the way, but in a rural area, jumping into a resident where we always eat together. There were waiters serving, and we were living like kings mm -hmm. in that resident. <laughs> the only task was do the PhD. Too. Our only concern, we never have to do a bed. Mm. We never have to clean a table. We never have to clean a dish. We are, we have people working for us. And our only, in this resident, our only task was to study, exactly like 700 years ago. Mm -hmm. So that was, for me, that made me easy mm -hmm. to work with Paolo um, for three years. I finished my PhD in 1992. Mm -hmm. uh, it was easy, th again, thanks to Paolo. Mm -hmm. He always, I mean, I, I never had really the, I don't know, the money to travel. F today is much easy, but at that time, I have to stay there, and it was easy, mm -hmm. thanks to Paolo. Right. Three years. Yes. Was uh, so, Juan Jose, uh, before uh, moving to Bologna, you actually uh, applied for a position in U.S.? Yes, I wanted, I, when I was doing my last year at the degree, I wanted to go out. This was clear to me. And this is, uh, I mean, I recommend to do the same even today. At that time, for me, it was mandatory. I knew, nobody told me, but I wanted to go out. So the first thing was try to go out to the United States. And there was a friend of, a Spanish person working at IBM, uh, Thomas Watson Institute in uh, New York. So I sent a, a letter and so on here and there, but I was not accepted to the United States. So that's why I took the first opportunity, which was going to Italy. Great. So uh, yeah. I try, yeah. So right, uh, about your PhD, um, Tell me, how was the experience? Uh, let's start with your research topic. But, uh, when I arrived to Italy, of course, I mean, to, to Bologna, uh, going to work with Paolo Top, Paolo Top was working on the TSP. So my topic was the TSP, of course. I mean, uh, I didn't knew, uh, I didn't know at that time that there is different topics. Everything there was around uh, the, the TSP. Uh, there, there was uh, working Paolo Todd and also Siparno Martello. The, uh, Paolo Todd was professor in Bologna since I was born, 1968. I mean, sure. Paolo Todd was a non professor there, a big boss, uh, working at that time together with Siparno Martello. They worked together on the NAPSA problem. That was the beginning. But Paolo's main topic was PSP. He was, he had been involving also Matteo Fischetti. Mm. Uh, Matteo Fischetti was his P first PhD. He finished in 1987. Then Mauro Delamico was the second. 
with Silvano Martello in 1990 when I arrived there and I arrived and started my PhD together with Daniele Vigo. Daniele Vigo was working on VRP, I was working on TSP. We were close together doing our three-year program and indeed we both finished in 1993. Mm -hmm. 19... But uh, before starting you had uh, the issue of uh, revalidating your undergraduate diploma in mathematics, yes. right? Yes, true. Yeah, at that time, um, I mean, today it's quite obvious that if you are, I don't know, if you are engineer in France, you are also engineer in Germany. If you have a degree in history in Spain, you also have the degree in Austria. But in the 90s, 30 years ago, it was not like that. Uh, I had a degree in mathematics in Spain but it was not valid in Italy. So I couldn't start really a PhD program with Paul on top in engineering, even in mathematics. The first thing that I have to do is to get a PhD a degree, to get a PA degree in Italy, and I took the easy way of getting a degree in mathematics. Easy because I knew algebra, geometry, everything. So for me, it was fast to get a degree mm -hmm. in Italy because I already have a degree in mathematics in mm -hmm. Spain. Mm -hmm. uh, with the degree, which I took it in the first year, then I jumped into the PhD program, mm -hmm. but not before. So I have to get a degree in mathematics in Italy. Um, again, once again, Paolo Tau was the key to do that. He knew colleagues in mathematics, Ilio Garigani in particular was my advisor mm -hmm. in mathematics for the degree and I got the mathematics degree so then I could follow the PhD with Paolo and Matteo Fischetti. Matteo was my uh, co-supervisor. Matteo, by the way, was also very, very useful, helpful. Together, Paolo and Matteo were, uh, one, yeah. uh, I mean, were the driver. Mm -hmm. I was simply the machine programming, implementing, learning. I, I have learned everything from Matteo Fischetti and from Paolo Tom. Great. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I start branch and cut, uh, polyhedral combinatorics, facet defining. Perhaps they also found my math background they, they were working in computer science, uh, engineering, electronic engineering faculty. Um, perhaps they saw me as a kind of right student for studying polyhedral combinatorics, mm -hmm. and that was the reason why I jumped into the polyhedral combinatory or some TSP variant, the uh -huh. generalized TSP, uh, orienteering, vehicle routing. I mean, I started doing polyhedral combinatory together with Matteo Fischetti in the 90s. Yeah, so that, that was my beginning. It's not easy at all. Uh, and at that time, uh, internet was not available uh, to the general <sighs> public uh, as today. And you had to find your way and, you know, get the papers uh, and also that all the entire process of submitting papers, reviewing papers, and so on. Can you tell me uh, how uh, was the experience? Uh, Mommy, it, it's true that it's always hard life for young people. That's always the case. Not only at that time for me, I was young at that time, but even today it's hard time for people. That's true. But they are a little different. I'm not saying that it was worse. It was just different. It's true. There was no email, everything, referee report, or when you submit the paper, you put it in an envelope, put the stamp and send, and everything go and return through boxes, uh, through postal email, I mean, uh, the person that come to you. Uh, even the computer were, of course, quite different. I mean, there was no, com no personal computer, there were the workstation, the big workstation, close in a room. Uh, in Bologna, for example, uh, 
eh, there was a room for Zipano, there was a room for Paolo, uh, there was a room for a big computer, and the students who were in the corridors. Uh, only, let's say, that when you finish your PhD, like Mateo, Mateo got a room inside a room, uh, the table in a room. But uh, the students were in the corridor, the big computer, quite slow compared with the computer that we have today, but I mean, they, they have their own room with the air condition and everything. We were working not with there was no window at the time, no MS DOS, no, not disk. Everything was through complicated machine that you type through the skin and a keyboard. Uh, but I have to say that this strong limitation of the computer helped me a lot to me and I think also to all the OR community. Because, for example, I remember that Paolo Tor, together with Silvano, they wrote very clever and very efficient codes just because they had a limited computer. Resources, By yeah. the way, they have a huge computer compared to the computer in other areas. But we're talking about computer with 8 megabytes, <laughs> megabyte, no gigabyte, megabyte, no kilobyte, no. I mean, really a small computer, and they have to implement algorithms being very efficient, very efficient uh, with your instruction. Today, today, I think that something that is not helping is that memory is cheap. So, for example, when I do something today with some of my students, they do not really understand why I try to save memory. Saving memory implies saving time. Because if you use little memory, then you, you will be efficient. If you fill thousands of gigabytes, just writing and reading is a waste of time. At that time, 30 years ago, limited memory, very, very slow computer, forced you, forced me to implement good codes. And it was a very good motivation. Today, when you have thousands of megahertz in your computer or even in the cloud, mm -hmm. It's not so easy to say, oh, you need to save memory. Why? It's cheap. At that time, it was not a question of money. There was no memory enough. Either you are clever or your computer, your code will not run. Yeah. So at that time, that was the beginning also of, for example, Cplex. Cplex, uh, there was version 1. Uh, the, uh, arrived, Paolo probably got the money. Paolo, Paolo was always the big boss, mm. having the last thing of everything, the, the modern thing. Um, he was a big boss and he got simplest person one, probably also thanks to Matteo. Mm. Um, it was running on this vast computer. It was a kind of uni early Unix computer. Mm. Mm -hmm close, a little close to what was the first version of Microsoft, MS-DOS, mm -hmm. no window, mm -hmm. everything typed on a command line, yeah. kind of early Linux, mm -hmm. kind of early Linux. That was the computer, uh, Simplex One, for example, at the time was only a primal simplex algorithm for solving linear programming. So, for example, I was implemented at that time a branch and cut. Brechenkart was the pioneer of Brechenkart was uh, Padber and Rinaldi. That mm -hmm. was the mm -hmm. time of Padber and Rinaldi. Yeah, yeah. But we were a little later implementing similar thing for other problem using the primal simplex algorithm in simplex 1.0. And when I came, for example, to Tenerife, at that time I was also teaching just for getting some money in some courses here. I also found another computer in Tenerife 
again, another unit computer, and it's succeeding copy, getting a copy of Simplex 1 working in that Unix in Bologna and having a copy <laughs> in running internally for my code. Again, it was at that time there was no license manager or not all these mm -hmm. complicated things that we have today. At that time, you have to compute them with the same system a code in one run in the other because there was not all these license controls that mm -hmm. we have today. So they just of course the, the early time in the uh, in that time. Again, limited memory, limited resource was a good motivation for implementing good codes. Paolo Tov, for example, implemented at that time wonderful lower bound to speed up Brecht and Van Walgory for, for example, for the beam baking mm -hmm. or for the TSP, uh, asymmetric version together with Christophides, mm -hmm. uh, he did other with Alice and so mm -hmm. I think force it for the limited resources. I'm not so convinced that with a today computer even a clever person like Paolo today would have invented what he did. Mm -hmm. Limited resources at that time was quite stimulating. I understand. So you were kind of constrained yeah. and you were forced to push uh, the efficiency of the algorithms to a very high level so it could actually really work in practice, right? Yeah. Yes. So yes, yes, at that time also, um, it was the beginning for me, I, I was introducing the C language. Mm. Pablo came from Fortran, mm. but okay from Fortran, I put the, the C. C was, uh, the, at least in Bologna, was at the beginning, and the debugger and all these things were helping to make the best from this limited resource, Bode mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, uh, so Juan Jose, Tell me uh, about uh, the results from your PhD. Uh, also, the first time you presented some work in a conference. Tell me about all the experience. Well, I think I, I was telling that the, the, my PhD was the beginning of Simplex. It was the beginning also of C, the C program. Not, not, the, not the beginning of C in the world, but it was the beginning of C in, in Bologna. Mm. <laughs> Uh, and also it was the beginning of LaTeX. We start, I started at that time introducing the, the text because I started typing in text before there was a word start. And, uh, yeah. and I remember the internet, for example, the, the, my first manuscript was never submitted, but I presented in a conference in Spanish in Portugal, in Evora. Mm. It was the Hispanolusas, a kind of uh, if that was in the 1990, at the beginning. Um, I presented there some model that, uh, that I wrote in a typewriting machine. <laughs> I mean, you, where you simply write. That, that was the first thing. But again, for the PhD in, in Bologna, I started working in LaTeX. Uh, my first conference in, in English was in 1992 when I was almost going to finish my PhD. Mm. It was just at the beginning, at the end. It was in Helsinki, in the Euro conference. Mm -hmm. And I remember that I, it was of course on the topic of the, the of the, my PhD, it was on the generalized travel selection problem, a facet mm -hmm. inequality for it, for the polydrome. And I remember that in the first line there was sitting Egon Balash. Wow. Egon Balash was sitting in the first line. I was, I mean, my talk was supposed to last for 20 minutes plus five minutes for question. I did it in 10. <laughs> I didn't miss nothing. I simply, I, I have tried so many times before, I was training so many times but when I saw it on Balas, plof, double <laughs> speed, and I tried to finish as fast as I could. Yes, Igon Balas was in the first line of my first 
confident in English. So I, I think I have, but by the way, he didn't come for me. He came because I was co-author of Paolo Todd mm -hmm. and Matteo Fischetti. So probably he came to the room thinking that Paolo Matteo was going to, was a speaker, but I wasn't, it was me. So instead of 20 minutes, I was so nervous that I put double speed and I finished half time. <laughs> so I had a lot of questions for, from the audience. Yeah. How was your oh, English? No, How was your English back then, uh, during the early 90s? Oh, uh, well, you can see my English now, so it was even much worse. It was much worse. No, I mean, uh, it was my beginning. And, uh, before going to Italy, I didn't speak uh, nothing of Italian. Uh, but Italian is easy. Italian is very easy. I, I remember that the first thing that Paolo recommended me was to learn Italian. Uh, he sent me to a school. But I mean, learning Italian, I didn't know nothing. But when I was together with people from Germany or people from Japan, I remember that the first day the school made us an exam just to put in the right level. I knew that I didn't know nothing, but they insisted to making me an exam. I remember that for the exam they gave us a piece of newspaper with the news and a set of questions. And I remember the first question. The first question is, Dove è la nave? Mm -hmm. And in the piece of paper there was a sentence saying, La nave è al porto. Mm. So I simply wrote the question and they sent me to the advanced level. <laughs> uh, on Tuesday, I mean, I was there, but immediately after 10 minutes, the teacher came to me and said, sorry, you cannot be in this room because you don't know the future and you need to learn. So the day after, on Wednesday, I went to the intermediate level. And once again, after five minutes, the teacher came to me and said, you are not in the right level because to be here, you need to know the present and you don't know the present. So then I went on Thursday to the starting level where I found the Japanese, Chinese, uh, <laughs> other people saying, mi piace Bologna. <laughs> I couldn't, I mean, it was so basic that I couldn't resist. So I, did, I didn't continue going to the school. Instead of that, I was young, I got a, an Italian girlfriend, and I, in a couple of months, I got a reasonable Italian language. Much more effective that, like so, that. <laughs> With English, with English, well, going to conference, reading newspaper, I mean, reading articles, books, uh, to going to conference. I think that today I can give talk. People mm. keep inviting me, so I think they, I can, I succeed in saying something. For so sure, my yeah. English have improved a lot. My okay. English have improved. Uh, it's true that when I did my PhD, I didn't have English at all. Yeah, I've seen a couple uh, of your uh, talks, and they're all they're um, they were amazing. So um, you you're doing perfectly fine. And uh, Juan Jose, uh, do you remember when you have when you had your first paper accepted in a journal? Yes, uh, I mean my first paper was in Network uh, in '95. 95, again, on the same topic where I gave my first company. Um, I, I, it, had been, it had been a quite cited paper, by the way. Mm -hmm. It was, uh, I mean, every single time was again by post, uh, took a long time, years. <laughs> Indeed, uh, I mean, it was published in 95. Wow. And it was something that I wrote in 92. So implementation. By the way, I do not have even the code because today the same computer. I mean, uh, couldn't I, I? I couldn't keep with the same code because at a certain point we went from the old box system, box based system, to the new Linux or other computer. So yes, I, I remember that, that paper. It got a lot of citation, but it was it took. Too much time in the mm -hmm. reference report. Everything was by me. At that time, one year, if you get an answer in one year, you were lucky. 
in one year. <laughs> I mean, if you get an answer of the ref in one year, you were, you were lucky. I think because my co-author were Paolo Todd and Matteo, I was not too bad. But yeah. today are much quicker. Today, journal have websites and everything is through internet. And unfortunately, the system is still too slow. Mm. But nothing compared with mm -hmm. 30 years ago. Right. We have improved it. Have improved. So, uh, yeah. what did you do after finish your PhD? Well, I also, immediately after I finished my PhD, one of the nice things that I, I remember with a lot of uh, interest, I'm quite proud of it, was to follow a summer school. Mm. Today, by the way, I recommend. I even push my student, force my student to go to Euro summer or winter summer school before they finish. It's fundamental. It's strongly recommended. But at that time, there were not so many schools. I mean, every, everybody has to learn together with somebody else in the same office. Mm -hmm. There was no internet, there was no email, they, you, there was no PDF, you, everything was on paper. You go to the photocopy machine where you queue because there is another student photocopying another paper. Uh, everything was on, on paper, on hard paper. Mm -hmm. um, so at that time, um, I mean, I didn't go to schools before the PhD, but I did it after. And in particular, I remember one uh, that I did in Paris. It was a Euro Summer School, uh, Euro Summer Institute. Uh, Euro organized a school for PhD students mm -hmm. every year, several of them. And I was very lucky because I was one of the first one. Uh, I met there people, you know, I'm talking about 1994. So 25 years ago. And I met there people that you know, uh, are know in our community. I'm talking about Alberto Cabrera. Mm. I'm talking about, uh, well, Alberto Cabrera, who was also in Bologna, uh, had uh, mm -hmm. uh, an accident. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Sad, sadly. Uh, Peter Cooley mm -hmm. in London, uh, Federico de la Croce mm -hmm. in Torino. Uh, Federico Manucelli, who is now for professor in Milan, David Pissinger in yeah. Copenhagen, <laughs> one of my heroes, uh, Cés Cesar Rego, uh, which is Nazi, uh, now in Mississippi. Cesar Rego, mm -hmm. uh, I think, is Porto. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. He did the work with Fred Glover, I think. Yes. Eranda Sela in Graz, uh, first Ulrich, uh, also quite known in Big Baking, Elena Ramahino that you sure. interviewed a couple of weeks ago. Wonderful person. Uh, yeah. Alper Antaptu, who is in Berkeley University, uh, why not for mixing it? I mean, I, I met in this school many people that helped me to, to keep a network. Because again, I have visited David Pissinger, and he can send me a student, and I have uh, been I'm doing, we have joint paper together. Mm -hmm. I mean, and, and with other also, I mean, uh, with Alberto, of course, uh, and with other people we have done after that uh, school, uh, several project publication. There were, the, the professors that we got in that school uh, were also known, like for example, Jakov Kraru. I don't know if you know him, he was mm -hmm. one of the pioneers, uh, I don't think so. Euro funder. He was Euro president. Uh -huh. uh, Jaco Carlo, but also Catherine Rogerol, General Plateau, uh -huh. Herb Thierry. I mean, uh, good professor. I recommend every student to go to summer school somewhere. Mm -hmm. I have been even in the last year as, uh, as teaching some of the professor, invited professors of them. For example, I was in Pacotí. In Fortaleza, yeah, I love you, a I think. couple of years ago, in an Elavio yeah. school, also in Estoril, invited by Luis Cubella and in some other. So I highly recommend a student, PhD student, to go to a school, even if somewhere else, outside, 
There are many, wonderful, no matter the topic. Mm -hmm. No matter the topic. Just for the French, from, it's good just for the network that mm -hmm. they will create. Highly recommend it, yes, highly recommend it. And then you went to uh, different countries, right? For a uh, yes, short period? Um, yes, I, I was, well, uh, after my PhD, I kept going to Bologna and Padova. In Bologna with Paolo Todd, in Padova with uh, uh, Matteo, while I was keeping my Italian girlfriend. <laughs> I was almost going to, to stay there. But then, um, I mean, uh, let's say my relation with my girlfriend broke and I jumped into the United States. Wow. I was invited by a professor, Sebastian Zedia. He's original from Argentina, mm -hmm. but was working for many years at Columbia University. He invited me in 1999 mm -hmm. and I was there a semester. Also, Gilbert Laporte invited me to Montreal for other two semesters in Montreal, I was to Montreal University in 2000 and 2002. Uh, there I met, I mean, Gilbert, of course, I was, uh, I did a several wonderful paper with him, brilliant person. Mm -hmm. Before I was talking about Paolo Todd, brilliant, but Gilbert is is also another yeah. in the Olympus of our uh, area. Yeah. But being in Montreal, I met there also wonderful researchers in our area, like Michel Cendro, sure. uh, Bernard Cendro, uh, Teodoro Creini, and also Jean-François Cordeaux. <laughs> Jean-François Cordeaux was finishing the PhD by that time. He finished in 1999. And I arrived in Montreal in 2000, so he he was starting. I mean, his brilliant career. Uh, and after that, I also went in 2006 to Brussels, invited by Martin Labe. Mm. And again, in, also in in Brussels, I met, for example, Bernard Ford. Bernard Ford is also today a well-known person in the telecommunication area. Uh, he finished his PhD also uh, in the same time of the 1998. Mm. Uh, 2007, I went to Milano, invited by Federico Manichelli, one of the friends mm -hmm. that I did in Paris. Um, he, in Milano, I met Francesco Mafioli. Francesco Mafioli was an old boss, colleague of Nelson Maculano. Ah. The, I, I mean, Francesco Mafioli and Nelson Maculan were pioneers of the matroid theory, a wonderful material that they give to all the community. You know? mm -hmm. I mean, many of us have learned, I mean, I think Nelson together with Francesco and probably um, Edmond uh, and other people, I mean, they created this wonderful theory. Also, when I was in Milano, uh, there was the beginning of Eduardo Maldi, also now in the area of telecommunication and um, uh, incubator optimization. And in some way, I have been traveling uh, not so long period, uh, except, let's say, in the last eight years, where I have been going to Lancaster University, invited by Adam Lechford, mm -hmm. where I have also met uh, people like Richard Iglis or mm -hmm. Matthias Ergot. Richard Iglis was another Euro president. So, mm -hmm. if you observe, I have been in a very narrow contact with several people that have worked for the Euro society. Um, I say Paolo Todd, Silvano Martello. Um, Richard Iglis. Um, so, in, for that reason, I think that you also feel quite in debt. I mean, I, I need to do things for, for Euro, for society, and for that thing, I mean, you have to need to create a society. We all need to, to keep a network. Network is, fu is fundamental for the old people and for the young people, for creating what 
in Spain we call cantera. Mm -hmm. So to now I have been mentioned in several places where I have been both in North of America and Europe, but I also have been many times in South of America. Uh, I was born in South of America, so I link it to there. South and Central America, I've been in, in La Habana. La Habana has a wonderful school on mathematics and there are uh, good research in university research. I have been in La Habana at least three, four times, but also in Barranquilla, Cartagena de India, eh, Pucón, Construcción, Chile, Santiago, Uruguay, Lima. I mean, South of America is, is a country full of human resource. I mean, there is a, a, a lot of young people. Uh, again, as I mentioned before, I was teaching a, teaching a PhD course in, in Venezuela for several years, and I got wonderful people from there. They have collaboration. So uh, even in South of America, Kennedy Island, in some way, Kennedy Island, try to join uh, Europe uh, South of America. And my university is offering courses trying to attract people from South of America. We are linked. We have, I do not only have the link because I was born there, but also because in our country, Kennedy Island try to, to do this link between Europe and South of America. So hopefully, hopefully, we will get uh, people interested in visiting me, our program, our group uh, in the near future. Yeah. Because we have the resources. We don't have the human resources, but we have the university, the experience. We have, unfortunately, we don't have any more the young people. You know that Europe is getting older. Mm -hmm. So we need the young brain in, in South of America. We should definitely so talk. Europe alive. I have the yes. human resources you need, maybe. So maybe you can talk and oh, I can send certainly. students to, to I've, I've sent uh, some students for doing PhD abroad. Uh, but I don't know, maybe for doing an internship with you, uh, some undergrad students, perhaps if there is opportunity, uh, we can talk about that for sure. Uh, I mean, it's true, that, it's true that Spain is not living the best time. Probably the world today, you no, know, I mean, this crisis due to the COVID and so on. But hopefully, this will be solved soon and we will go back again to the good time. I'm talking about two years ago, where we were moving people, getting people, sending. I mean, the, I think Canary Island is a good place for for learning. Uh, we have visitors, some of them long time, other time, short times. Uh, we have received people like, I don't know, Igor Bala was here, for example, Michael Conforti, I say at the beginning, Paolo Top. Mm -hmm. True, not for the university, they came for the weather, but anyway, they came. And from time to time, we receive people. For example, I, I, I have done several Good work with some people that have come here for, for the weather. Like, for example, uh, I think together with Francois Lugo, uh, some nice papers I seen on stochastic programming for the pickup and delivery TSP. So, I mean, this area attracts people for the weather and we can use this opportunity. Again, Spain is quite worried about, um, I mean, the rule that. Spain need to play with South of America. We are in debt for that, and I think that Spain, Spain have some program to help, or the European Union. Mm -hmm. So I think there are some opportunities that we can investigate. Hopefully, again, there will be a student interested in visiting us. Right. Uh, you were mentioning some work uh, about uh, stochastic programming for uh, pickup delivery problems. Mm -hmm. I myself, uh, <laughs> have come, come across your work for the first time during my PhD myself uh, and it was that work on projection results for vehicle routing uh, that is I think it appeared in Math Prague and also years later I also uh, came across your work on the one commodity pickup and delivery TSP the one PDTSP problem that is very famous uh, but in your opinion uh, I mean what were your main contributions Look, uh, I think the, the main contribution in that work 
No, in general, I'm saying in your career. Yeah. Uh, I mean, perhaps, yes, the pickup and delivery is one of the main topics, perhaps. Uh, I mean, there are different variants there, no? And in my opinion, something which is quite challenging, and where we have been working and probably some things, are on the split demand. Mm. Because split demand means that the vehicle visits a customer more than once. And when there is a node with several arc going in and out, you need to order the arc and you need to pair and say, I come in with this and go out with this, and then I return with this other and go out with that. So when there are several visits to a node, this is something, let's say, different than the DSP. Mm-hmm. One of the characteristics of the DSP is that every node is visited one. But if you work with a split demand, you have a node that is visited more than one. And then you have, for example, two are going in, two are going out, and it's not easy. Which R is the going in associated with the go out? And we have used flow models for that. And then, Flow models are easy to be projected. Mm. So when you have a flow formulation, the immediate thing that comes to your mind is better the composition. Mm. Why not to remove the continuous variable and add inequality on the X variable, on the mm. binary variable? And once you get the, the vendor card, you say, let me try to strengthen that vendor. So one of the nice things of the pickup and delivery, with or without a split, is that you have flow model that suggests you, force you to project. And when you have the projection, you are forced to strengthen that projection, trying to leave some coefficient. And if you succeed, and in particular for the one commodity, we have succeeded, you get new inequality, a kind of a stronger bender cut, mm. a stronger bender cut. I'm not saying that they are facet, but maybe they are near to be facet. This is a rich area where we, I mean, together with Hippolito, or one of my colleagues, but mm-hmm. also Immaculada, Jorge Riera, we have a little thing where we have been working the last year in trying to apply better decomposition projection method mm-hmm. to get new inequality that later on we try to improve lift coefficient mm-hmm. try to make it stronger mm-hmm. so to embed in a branch and cut and by the way why not in a branch and cut a price mm-hmm. sure so um this is a rich area, I think. That, that's a rich area where perhaps it's our main topic, the pickup and delivery. Still, it's not the topic where I have to get more funding. It's not the topic. To be honest, the first work that we did on the pickup and delivery was because we read the paper by Daniel Digo and Gibelapor on the full bottle and empty bottle, which they call pickup and delivery. But it's a very easy pickup and delivery because if you have full bottle and empty bottle, the capacity of the vehicle needs to be higher than the sum of the full bottle and the sum of the empty mm-hmm. bottle because your truck will collect all the full bottle. So you are working with a TSP with a very large capacity and that's made the problem easy. In the pickup and delivery, one commodity, we don't have full and empty. We just have bikes, for example, bicycles. Yeah. And we only need to, and we need to be more clever because perhaps the capacity of the track is not the sum of all the negative extension where you have to deliver or 
the positive station where you need to pick up. No, perhaps it's even smaller and you need to switch from one to the other, which made the problem stronger. So we start working not on the one commodity, we start working to find a different method to solve the full and empty bottle. And then for that reason, we found the one commodity. And we submitted the paper in 1995, I mean, like 25 years ago. It, it was not easy, it was rejected. Always by one question, mainly. There was always the same question by everybody. What's the practical the application? What's the practical application? They say, oh yes, it's a nice theory, blah, 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 but what is, why is that useful, this pickup and delivery one commodity? And I remember that we simply invented the application and say, <laughs> oh, you may collect money from one bank and move the money to another. And I remember that, yeah, for some reason it didn't convince too much until we found the bike sharing. That was the door for that uh, problem. Uh, the pickup and delivery one commodity came to the interest of the people when it was linked to the buy sharing yeah, system. Yeah, yeah. It's not exactly the same because it's true that in the buy sharing you have many other things. Um, everything is not on a static demand, but you have also a stochastic. Uh, the driver that is collecting or rebalancing the system uh, is working at the same time like the customer. You have uh, different vehicles. You have, I mean, it's true. The buy sharing is more complicated, but it's more realistic. Why the one commodity pickup and delivery is academic. Mm -hmm. I mean, but I think even if it was an academic problem, it was. It deserves study. And indeed, as they say, we I think we found interesting a stronger bender cut study the academic problem, even if we didn't succeed at the beginning in finding the practical application. <laughs> the practical application came later. Uh -huh. You work it on the practical Yeah, quite a, quite a bit. Yeah, there's the split demand. Manuel. Yeah, with Manuel, yeah, yeah. also. Uh, uh, with split demand, uh, there's a strong relationship with bike sharing. And yes. there are some problems are really similar. I think it deserves a sort of a convergence between the notation and terminology of both classes of problems, perhaps. Uh, but yeah, it's it's a very, very challenging field, I, I believe. Yeah, also because in the split demand, as I said at the beginning, in the split demand, you allow different visits to the customer because mm -hmm. the demand is not served once, but maybe served different uh, different visits. But also, you need to know what part of the demand will you serve in each visit. So there is a new variable, mm -hmm. which, by the way, is not integer; it's continuous in many yeah. cases. I mean, you want to know will I serve thirty percent? 33, uh, will I serve 20 plus 20 plus what? I mean, this amount create an extra complexity in the model. Mm -hmm. And it's quite challenging, quite interesting. So certainly that is a nice topic, uh, the pickup and delivery. Mm -hmm. But again, for me, this has been more academia. Uh, from the practical point of view, uh, my main topic was not the pickup and delivery. Uh, my main topic was in a statistical disclosure control, protecting sensitive information for statistical agencies. Really? Uh, <laughs> this was, yeah. This was, this was a, a, a research area that, I mean, gave me money. Because we work for the European, for Eurostat. Mm -hmm. Uh, Eurostar create different European project. Uh, we got funds for doing software that today are being used in many statistical agencies in Europe and also in uh, all over the world. Uh, we use it, for example, I was in New Zealand, for example, <laughs> in Stalin and giving some 
seminar on a statistical distortion control is protecting sensitive information. Uh -huh. People are worried about confidentiality and we produce a software for that, for the statistical engineers. This was a topic that they started in the 1898. Uh, I was introduced together with Matteo Fischetti uh, by Giancarlo Leistra. Giancarlo Leistra at uh, CBS in Netherlands. I know, yeah, uh, scheduling and stuff like that. Yeah, they, they were very close to the European Union and they put a combinatorial problem. The problem is when you have a table, when you have a table with data, columns and rows, you have some cells that you cannot publish because everybody knows what is behind. And because there are the total, you also need to protect, to suppress another cell in the same column and row. And in some way, you need to create cycle. Mm -hmm. So from the mathematical point of view, protecting a table is identical to solve a kind of big routing problem. Mm -hmm. You need to create cycle. So honestly, between you and me, it was not a big finding, but for the European Union, for the company, uh, was the night, I mean, it was the day, it mm -hmm. was the light. Mm -hmm. they, they really Just break appreciated them. and it was important. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. we create a software mm -hmm. and this has been something, and not only in a statistic, not only suppressing cells, but also surrounding cells, they, we, we did control rounding, and we also work on data editing. Mm -hmm. We have done different software in my group uh, in Tenerife uh, for a statistical agency. Mm -hmm. Again, we have published a few papers, so in the literature you can find some of these articles, but it's true that it's not so, it's not, compared to big routing, the interest is more for a very small audience. Okay. There are more people interested in vehicle routing, logistics, rather than in statistical confidentiality. Mm -hmm. But this was a nice area too. Mm -hmm. Also, you have to say another uh, airline. Airline, we have done the schedule, crew scheduling. Uh, for aircraft and for crew, we have done the scheduling together with Valentina Cacchiani from Bologna again, another student of Paolo. Mm -hmm. um, but Yes, it was also kind of half academia, half company. I didn't get money from that. <laughs> but it was nice. We published a few papers in transportation science and things. So, I mean, we, we, we get a lot of fun working on brand, calling generation uh, and this type of thing. That, right. That, that, uh, yeah, finally, uh, Juan Jose. Uh, I noticed uh, that you were working with in some projects that are related to astronomy. Tell me more about that. Yes, there's a little thing um, in astronomy. I mean, uh, Kennedy Island uh, has a, I mean, in Tenerife, where I live, is a small uh, island, it's a very small island, turning around is slightly smaller than 200 kilometers. You can never, I mean, you can never go farther than 100 kilometers mm -hmm. around. But there is a mountain with almost 4,000 meters. And because of the altitude, uh, Europe has invested a lot of money in a, a telescope. Mm -hmm. There are very good, bomb, I mean, the best telescope in Europe, um, some of the best in the world, are located in Canary Island. 4,000 meters, clean sky, so there is a lot of infrastructure and what well, have been possible with some logistic problem, in particular selecting the stars, selecting the star for an object that need to analyze is another nice combinatorial problem. Uh, it's also a kind of big routine too. <laughs> I mean, it's also a kind of result. So between you and me, I have not found so many new results, but I studied one thing and applied to many different areas, and astronomy is one of them, true. Yeah, but that's somewhat unusual. 
and very fascinating, uh, at least in my opinion. So uh, I think there are challenges there too. And maybe it's something that you've been used to, like studying routing problems. But when you apply to a different area, it might be revealing. I don't know, something more interesting in that sense. Yes, in particular, for example, in astronomy, uh, I mean, they have this uh, problem of uh, selecting objects uh, where they have a kind of uh, image, a kind of tools where they make a photograph. Um, this is also quite connected to, computation, to computational geometry. Mm -hmm. So there are some problems also in computational geometry that are very much related uh, to probably to combinatorial problem, probably in, in OR. Mm -hmm. So I think astronomy is just an excuse to apply mathematics uh, <laughs> somewhere. So I think it's a link, true. Great. So Juan Jose, for me, it was a great pleasure to have you here. Uh, I had tons of fun. It was wonderful. Uh, I hope also you had a great time. And, you know. Oh. oh, certainly. Thank you. I, yeah, I mean, want to thank you. And I hope that uh, the people listening will find something interesting. I will tell you if this is the case, just in case I get people interested in visiting me, or at least more submission in our journal. I mean, I'm now managing a few journals where I would like to to get more submitted paper, mm -hmm. papers. No, I mean, I, I associate, to, for example, of uh, the Euro Journal on Computational uh, Optimization, that we need the uh, papers. Also in top, the Spanish World Journal, which is a journal, is an international journal. It's true that the owner is the Spanish Society, but it's a journal managed by uh, Springer, and we need paper. So hopefully people will be interested in what I do, and we we'll submit more papers <laughs> to top and to Euro Journal on Computational uh, optimization, also Omega, computer application research, etc. So hopefully we will get interested people in doing what we do. Thanks absolutely. to you. No, come on, absolutely. Thanks to your work and to all your enthusiasm. So you owe me a visit, Jose. You told you like South oh. America. You've been to all over the place. Maybe you uh -huh. can visit us when all this crisis. You know, it's over and we're looking forward to, to have you here. And also maybe we can send students to, to collaborate with you. And uh, I, anyway, uh, I wish you all the best. Uh, es una persona muy amable. Muchas gracias. And hasta luego. Bye. <laughs> Oye, muchas gracias. Hasta luego a ti. Un saludo. Chao. Gracias. Chao. Chao. Bye, everybody.